Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first third Wednesday session for 2022. Um, this is the third year now. We're entering the third year of doing this. Uh, we started in February 2020. And, um, and our mission this year is to, is to build bigger ideas and to deliver them better. Uh, and, and with your support, in, in, the, in this kickoff event, We'd like to introduce the, the um, Hendy Global Alumni theme for 2022, which is sustainability. And um, as, a, as a business school and, and as business school alumni, the area of sustainability where we can make the biggest impact is in leadership. And, and hence the name of this event, uh, Leadership for a Fairer World. And so, so right off the bat, um, I could invite you to, to email me about uh, a, a closed group we have on Hendy Live called the, the the Yes Futures Group, which is a a brand new group which is which is which is basically our our seed group of sustainability uh, change agents. And so we'd love you to we'd love to expand the numbers and and to expand the group. So I'll share my email in the chat while we're going today, and uh, feel free to email me and I'll and I'll. I'll, I'll uh, be back at you with some directions on how to on how to uh, join the group. So, what I'd like to do now is we've got a very exciting uh, 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 lineup. Uh, hey, John, great, great, great to see you with us. And um, I saw Ralph there as well uh, from Ghana. So it's looking like a hello, a, a, hello. It's a it's a stellar uh, kickoff. So thanks for all, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Hendley's Director for Alumni and Engagement, Jean-Pierre Choulet. And uh, Jean-Pierre is gonna, gonna talk us through some, uh, some really exciting developments for, uh, for 2022. Uh, bonsoir, Monsieur, over, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Barry. And, and, uh... Thank you all for this fantastic uh, gathering of uh, Henley Business School alumni. It's an honor to be there with you. I think the, this event has grown as a key asset of our Henley Business School community. And uh, I'm very honored to be with you uh, today. Um, you won't believe it, but when we, when we launched uh, one year ago, we started to work on this idea of what academic year 2122 could be for the 87,000 alumni. Yeah, you have heard well. And the business school alumni community is 87,000 strong from over 126 countries. So we, one year ago, when we, when we started to think with Kevin, with uh, John Foster, with Barry, also, my friend Chris in uh, Denmark, Anu in Finland, Chris Rodona. We thought that it might be perceived as a crazy idea by, by our alumni community. Sustainability and societal impact in a business school. The place for profit, finance modeling, uh, leadership from a certain perspective, and you know what? The answer from the alumni network has been amazing. The input from all of you has been amazing. And you know what? Now, leaders at the business school level, they think it was their idea. Okay, no problem. I'm happy to surrender. I'm happy to give this idea back to them because my intimate conviction is that what education is about is to build the talents, to build the people who will be able to transform the world. And what is it we need now? Is not sustainability and societal impact as something we think about sometimes. It has to be a virtue, a value we embed in the kernel of everything we do. And that's why I'm very proud that uh, Academic Year 21-22 and it's very likely that academic year 22, 23 is going to be on the same vein, is devoted to sustainability and societal impact. Now, let me say a massive thank you to Professor Kevin Monet. Without academic insight, without research, without cutting edge knowledge, 
Nothing is possible within a business school. The engine, the kernel of a business school is knowledge. And Kevin has been instrumental in uh, putting together a fantastic certificate on sustainability. And we are going to build more lifelong learning opportunities there. But today I want to focus on one particular action that we have launched this week. You know, most of the business school, when I'm, I'm sure you're waiting for me to do so. I'm sure some of you, you, you might have started this conversation tonight being suspicious, saying, oh dear, Jean-Pierre is going to ask us something. Not at all. I'm going to give you something. And I think that's the NA way. That's where NA is unique. We have set up a fund here at NA Business School, global, all the friends, John Foster, Kevin, Barry, myself, Dean John Board. We have set up a fund, 15,000 pounds, the innovation fund to support your initiative, to support NA Business School alumni initiative in the field of sustainability and societal impact. We have launched an application on NA Live. Please do register on NA Live. That's our digital campus. You know, if you're not on NA Live, you're nowhere. You have to register to NA Live. And there you will see on the homepage the launch of the Innovation Fund, a call for application to you, our alumni, entrepreneurs, ID generators, creators trailblazer, innovators, guys who think out of the box, please do apply. And you will get support from the business school. Of course, money, important, but also support from the Henley Entrepreneurship Center. And I'm very grateful to Professor Andrew Godley. The project that would be selected, the projects that would be selected and financially supported will also get support from the NA faculty, including the NA Center for Entrepreneurship. What is it about? To make it possible for you to start or to develop further any type of entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial idea uh, about sustainability and societal impact. So just before I hand over to uh, Dean John Foster Pedley, I just want to say it again, please join us on NA Live. Find your way to find the application link to the Innovation Fund and enjoy. Be creative, apply, and some of us are going to be supported by the Innovation Fund and benefit from a full support from Henley Business School to take your ID further. But all of us, we are going to enjoy this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Mamo. Thank you all our chapters in Africa. Thank you, Kevin, so much for bringing us the knowledge engine machinery into it. And I'm very proud to hand over to my dear friend, uh, Professor Jonathan foster Pedley. I say it with my French accent. Thank you. Eh bien, merci beaucoup, Jean-Pierre. That was fantastic. I say my French with my English accent. So well done. And it's such a pleasure to see everybody here. So many names I know. And to be honest, I really respect. So I was thinking, wow, what a privilege to share time with you and talk about things that we are so interested. And I'll try and do that so effectively, but I'm gonna try and do it quite authentically. And the topic is sustainability. And um, I have a thing called a suitcase word. And a suitcase word is a, a suitcase with a label on it saying strategy or communication. You open a suitcase word and it's packed and out come a thousand different ideas about strategy. And we try and sort of contain a, a, a vivid and clear idea about something by putting you know, a really vague and cliche and a multi-purpose word that actually ends up meaning nothing. So sustainability risks doing the same. So I'm gonna put a spin on it in my view. And, um, and I think sustainability comes with a, with a moral obligation. And I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to come with that straight up. And, and I think that's, it's important. I mean, none of us here are 
Well, very few are in their 20s or 30s or maybe 40s. Some people in their 50s, 60s, even 70s, could you believe it? And those people have lived, you know, and they have lived and they've understood life and they've lived long enough to see the consequences of things that we believe deeply in when we were young that were beneficial. One of those is the effect of how we carry our business on the planet and on our societies. Another is the effect of the developed world on a developing world. Another is something I've had to grapple to come to terms with, is the imperialistic background of colonialism and of the separation between, you know, of, of just these things that I was brought up to believe weren't bad and I had to learn were and why. Um, and sustainability is one such word like that. Yeah, you think sustainability is about keeping something the same. Okay, and in a sense it is because you know, if we have something called the Gini coefficient in South Africa, which represents the difference between rich and poor, um, it's, it's dreadful. I'm sitting in South Africa. It's the worst in the world. There's the most um, awful separation between the, the, a lot of money in a few hands and less opportunity money in others. And we can talk all we want about it and we can posture all we want. We can write papers all we want, but the dial doesn't move. There's, um, I'm sure Kevin knows this because he's, he's one of my heroes. And he, he talks about uh, leadership and sustainability. And um, they have a boat crew. I think it's Leander Club there in, in Henley. And they talk much, does it make the boat go faster? If I do this, does it make the boat go faster? So does our talk about sustainability and creating a world um, that isn't creating more poverty, more damage to itself, that is, on the other hand, building into a new possibility, is that something that, is our talk going to make a difference? Now, as middle-aged people, should dare I say that, we should understand quite a lot of things. And I think we have two toxicities in life that damage us. One is that when we see a problem, if you're clever, you spend an awful lot of time standing around it, rather like there's a hole in the road, and you've got all these people standing around discussing, how did that hole get there? What's the actual dimension? What's the perfect depth? What's the chemical composition of the rubble? You know, what's the gaseous composition of the explosives or whatever? And at the end of that, you've got a fantastic understanding of that hole and of why it got there, the missile that came in or whatever it was. We understand everything. And with that comprehension is this enormous satisfaction. Ah, oh, it's like an endorphin rush of saying, I've got it. Uh, yeah, we are we agreeing, guy. Yeah, we've agreed. Yeah. And, and we wander off. And the hole is still there. And whatever caused it is still happening. And, and I think that's one of the big dangers we have. The other thing we can do, and I think this is an academic um, challenge, and I think good academics don't do this, you can write enormous papers to analyze situations and present potential solutions. But again, the dial doesn't move. So what do I talk about age? I, I talk about age because I think if you are growing, if you have children, then I think having children comes with it a sense is you want to make a better word for those kids. And I think we all share that in common. We have kids, a lot of us do. We want a better world for them. So if we see a problem, we can't just analyze it and walk away because now we have our kids. Now we have to do something. We have to make the world somehow different. And even writing a paper and coming to an intellectual satisfaction isn't enough. What we have to do, I think, is, is embrace activism, that dangerous word which represents dangerous, ferocious, de destroyers of societies and the status quo. This status quo is dangerous. This, the way we run businesses is quite often dangerous. We can do better. I'm sure that business schools can do better by providing alternatives. This initiative, as I see it, is a basic framework for a group of people coming together, not to find comfort in their community, but to find discomfort in communal support for an action that matters. And that action that matters, I think, is to start challenging why people are living in unfair and uh, difficult situations, um, why poverty exists, why uh, businesses don't look beyond the boundaries of their balance sheets to see the consequences of their actions. They, they, they cause costs into society and it's not, they don't record them, they don't have to account for them, and they have to ignore them. Our intellectual capability to summarize and theorize distances ourselves from the felt experience of people hurt, of nature, of the environment, all the things that we want our kids to experience well. So I'm afraid to say that I think there is a moral obligation 
um, that when you see something and you see a hole, you can't walk away anymore. And I think that, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of those, a lot of those things are, are supported by what well, laws. There are some things that are legal and there are some things that are norms, normative. And I think we're guided by both. So, you know, you can, you can say there are two types of laws, you have just and unjust, you know, you can, you should obey just laws always, but it, you have a, you know, one, you don't have a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey, obey just laws and just rules and just societies and just corporate structures and, and law. But you have a moral responsibility to display, disobey unjust laws. And if you look at people like um, Colin Mayo, who wrote a wonderful book called Prosperity, where he's looking at the foundation of corporate law and addressing it and how this creates a continuation of a Milton Friedman-esque profit model, whereas we should be looking at, at the society and laws and companies that create mutual prosperity for societies. He says the basis of that problem is in poor corporate law and poor corporate constructs. I've got three minutes left, so it won't be long. So I think that, um, I think the non-just law is no law at all. And I think we have an obligation now to, for our children and for society, and because you have a vision, you have clarity, is to move beyond talking about it into now acting. And I think that's what a great business school, future business schools will do. You know, um, and if something, and if something creates, I mean, if you're on board a ship, this is what Extinction Rebellion talks about. If the ship is on a collision course to the rocks and everybody on board is gonna die, and, and you are not allowed as a passenger to, to do anything, the passenger should, re, should raise the alarm and the trajectory should change. And actually the passengers become bound to do everything they can to stop the ship hitting the rocks. I used to be a commercial pilot and we have something called graded assertiveness in flying to stop accidents happening. And what you do, if you have a, if you have a really tyrannical captain who's not listening to his young co-pilot, and this tyrannical platform is completely out of date with the law, uh, with, with what's going on. The co pilots have been too, too, too cowed, too shy to confront them, and the airplanes are crashed, killing everyone on board. So, graded assertiveness stops that happening. The first thing you should do is to probe. Okay, it's interesting that our airplane is going. So, we, we are doing 140 knots, Captain, okay, if you, and decreasing in speed. That means you're close to coming to stall. Okay, nothing happens. So, you say, you, then you alert. And you, that's the A, you say, we're doing 140 knots, Captain, and the speed is decreasing. We are going to stall soon, watch out. If nothing happens, we go to the C, which is to challenge. Captain, we are doing 140 knots, the speed is decreasing. We're gonna stall, stall in five seconds. If we do stall, we're gonna not be able to recover because our height, we will crash and everyone will die. Change course now, put on speed. Okay, that's the challenge. But the E is the most important thing because what happens in aviation and should I believe happen in companies and in our societies is the E, is the emergency, is the execute. At that point, the co-pilot says to the captain, you no longer have control. I have control of the aircraft. I'm taking control of this um, to avoid an accident. And you record that and you take over. Now, obviously I'm being provocative and obviously I'm not being funny and lighthearted. I'm being very sincere. I think we have a duty now to move from, to go through that pace, probe, alert, challenge, execute. I think we're facing in our world in, so we can do more for Africa, we can do more for societies, we can do more for people. And I think that I feel I have an obligation, not because I'm better, because I'm worse, because I was part of the problem. I admit that, I take it on board, and now I'm gonna try and do my best to do something about it. So that's how I'd like to start, my 14 seconds are over. Sorry to come in so heavy, um, but now I'm going to leave it to the real experts to kind of take it on. So let's do something. I think we have the power. Let's have a go. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, so inspiring. And it's, yeah, wow. So thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm next. Uh, I'm Professor Kevin Money sitting here in a grey England. And, and that's the, the beauty of uh, you know, Jean-Pierre and I sharing the same sky. So he knows that I'm not lying. Um, but it's it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. It's it's also amazing, you know. So many bad things from COVID, but you know, one of the good things is the ability to connect like this to to people. I've seen some people driving their car. I've seen people, you know, in different parts clearly of of the world. To me, uh, just looking at the sky, and it's it's wonderful to be able to connect with you today and and to share our work. And as JP said earlier, to to see how there might be attraction between some of the academic we've th thinking we've been doing. 
and the practical action that you can take. And, and I'm also hugely uh, proud to have Kanye today, uh, Kanye, who's speaking after me, who's a, a real leader, a change agent, someone who's faced the, the issues of sustainability and done something with it. So, you know, when we planned today, it was very much around, you know, me setting the picture, setting the scene, a, a view on sustainability, almost painting a picture of the mountain. And then uh, Kanye is going to talk you through how, you know, she's tackled sustainability um, and also reflecting on her experience as, as a mountaineer. So there's a there's a connection there. So um, so let me let me you know, if you can bear with me, um, I'm going to share some slides, um, mainly to save you from looking so closely at my face. Um, you can now see some slides and uh, let's see if I can bring these up for you. As, as John Foster Pedley said earlier, you know, we, we're looking at sustainability, but we're looking at a, at a very particular angle on sustainability, okay? It's, it's sustainability and very much a human approach to it. So I'm going to talk you through in, in, the, you know, in the next 15 minutes a little bit of a history of the topic of sustainability, how other people see it, and then, you know, this Henley view on sustainability. And, and you know, it's different in that it's, you know, as, as uh, John Foster Pedley said, it, it puts the person at the heart of the problem, but it also puts the person at the heart of the solution. And I think for me, that's one of the big issues of sustainability is that it seems like such a massive issue. The easiest thing to do is to put your head under the pillow and pretend it's not happening, right? So, and that's and, and that's clearly what we shouldn't do, but that is sometimes how, how we um, respond to it. So if we, if we think about sustainability, you know, what is sustainability in academic terms? I think historically there, there have been two approaches and, and the first one is the oldest, right? This idea that sustainability is a firm's ability to sustain itself, right? To be profitable, to do, you know, to make money and essentially to be do okay for itself. And, you know, more than 20 years ago now, that view of sustainability was already becoming out of fashion and out of date because there was a recognition that sustainability isn't just about a firm's ability to sustain itself, but it's a, a firm's ability to sustain itself and also its responsibility to future stakeholders. The fact that we are custodians of this world, as John Foster Pedley said, not just for ourselves, but to the future. So the context, uh, and, and you know, forgive me for sharing some of this again, if you know this stuff, but we recently had COP26 in Scotland, um, where it was painting the picture of what do we know now about the world? What is the, the environmental context that we're living in? And this idea that we need to keep the world to uh, a two degree rise in terms of temperature to, to keep the world as a place that doesn't have floods, that ha doesn't have uh, you know, water security issues. And that's placed in the context of what we have done and who we are as a species. So this, this idea that our, our population in, you know, in 1804 was around 1 billion people, and it took us 200,000 years to get to 1 billion. You know, it didn't take us, you know, it took us 120 years or so to double that to 2 billion. And then, you know, not much longer, 40 years to 3 billion. And here we are in 2021, at 8 billion, and in 2050, we'll be at 10 billion. And if we look at that, there's something called an environmental burden, right? An environmental burden on the planet is consumption times population. And the savior to all of this is technology. Can we do things differently? So this interplay between how many people there are on the planet, what we consume, and the solutions that we find means that you know, the population is going up, so we've got to find the solutions. We have to find different ways to do things. And those innovative and different ways to do things, you know, reside with you, reside with the people on this call. You are the people who can make the changes and the differences in organizations and in business. Um, so the, the traditional approaches to, to sustainability, the traditional ways of looking at sustainability are, you know, a little bit like, like John was talking about earlier, that there are different levers, you know, we can, you know, and one of the big levers that we've seen uh, at COP26 is, is this legal lever, right? To say that governments need to commit to targets. They need to change laws, change rules to make it illegal to be uh, irresponsible, to make it illegal to be uh, not sustainable. And, you know, while that is a, a noble goal, governments are not the only solution. We, we can, um, you know, we can 
act, be activists for governments. But if we look at the world today, many of the biggest economies in the world are not necessarily governments. They're actually companies, they're organizations. So while the legal side is hugely important, it's not the only, only picture. In talking about sustainability, other people think about, you know, is a way to, to becoming more sustainable to, to report on our performance as an organization, not just in terms of the economic dimension, but to report on our performance in terms of our environmental dimension and our social impacts. And so this idea that <clears throat> of the triple bottom line, that there's a, a, an imperative for organizations to you know, report on planet, people, and profit. Um, this is probably the most common um, methodology in the space of sustainability. And I think one that, that, that adds a lot of value. And if, if you're not leveraging it as an organization, it's one that can, can help you speak to, to other organizations. The other well-established view on sustainability is, is the, you know, are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And, and this is a much more human approach. It's, it's this idea that um, you know, sustainability isn't just about business, but it's about the world that we live in. And, and how can we have a sustainable world if there is hunger? How can we have a sustainable world if there's poverty? How can we have a sustainable world if there is if there are inequalities. And so this notion of the of the UN uh, Sustainable Living Goals has been very powerful because it's been a mechanism to connect together people in different parts of the world, people in non-for-profit organizations and for-profit organizations around particular issues and particular goals. And it's a it's a very useful useful framework to break down a, a problem which is is all encompassing. If you can make a small contribution to one of these things and you know that there are 8 billion people also making a small contribution to many others, maybe sustainability is something that we can achieve. And, and I think it frees us up to, to do that. So it's, a, I think, a very valuable model. But it's, you know, from, from an academic point of view, I, I think they're, they're all very valuable and useful, but they, they miss one thing, right? They, they miss an understanding of, of why, as a human species, we've got engaged in unsustainable behavior in the first place. Right, so I, I'm a psychologist, and I'm I'm really interested in not just looking at the problem, the outputs, the the lack of environmental sustainability, the lack of social sustainability, or the lack of economic sustainability. I'm I'm interested in knowing why. Why are we doing it to ourselves? Right, <laughs> you know, we we know we shouldn't be, but why? And that's 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 the the piece of work that I'm going to share with you now. It's it's something that I've co-authored with Steve Payne, who's the the global head of sustainability and stewardship at Unilever. It's a model that's that's applied in Unilever to help them to, um, you know, launch their sustainable living plan, and, and and it has its roots in psychology. And then just let me talk you through what the model is and and, and how how it's different from what's around. Um, at its starting point, it it says that sustainability is a function of human behavior. We need to understand what will it take to get people to stop doing something? What will it get to start, you know, get people to start doing something? How can we get people to maintain good behaviors? It, it looks at sustainability and that's whether that's a government minister who's corrupt, it's whether it's a uh, consumer who's got a product choice. We're interested in understanding behavior. And, and if you're interested in understanding behavior, the key thing to, to do is to really understand motivation. And, and what we've done with what we're calling the better balance model is that we've shamelessly drawn upon um, some fantastic theories from the world of neuroscience from a guy called Nitin Noria, who um, used to be the, the Dean of Harvard Business School. He came up with this, this theory uh, called drive theory. And uh, what he's come up with with drive theory builds on a lot of what we know about neuroscience and, and you know we've done a lot of work with our neuroscience team over the last 10 years and one of the key things i think just to keep in mind is that human beings you know what we know from neuroscience is human beings are systems of conflict we're all conflicted right and you know while we used to think this part of our brain does this and that part of our brain does that and while that's true what is more true is that we're often in conflicts with ourselves about particular issues and if we look at, uh, you know, Lawrence and Nuria's drive theory, essentially what they're saying is that human beings have four key drives. We have four fundamental things that motivate us, right? We're all motivated to acquire 
good status and money, right? So we're driven to acquire things. We're all driven to bond. We're all driven to be part of a group. Uh, we're all driven to, to comprehend. You know, I loved, um, if any of you have ever read Sophie's World, uh, the, the, you know, this, the critique of, you know, Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason. Uh, Justin Gardner talks about, you know, if you take a ball for a dog and you throw the ball, what does the dog do? Chases the ball. If you throw a ball for a human being, what do we do? We say, why did you do that? We're looking for meaning. We're looking for purpose. And the final drive that, that um, you know, we have inside us is this drive to defend, to protect what is ours, right? And don't forget, all of these drives exist simultaneously, and they all compete with one another. In our research at Henley, we've you know, expanded the model a little bit to say, yes, there are four drives, but it may well be useful to split out this drive to comprehend into a, a drive for having meaning and purpose, and also this drive to, to continue, learn, and grow. It seems like these are two parts of the same drive. So you might know, those of you that remember anything about your MBAs or uh, your work at Henley, that there's a, there's a thing called Maslow's hierarchy where he talks about motivation. You know, we start off with this need to, you know, have food and then to bond. And, you know, on one level, you know, it's a great theory, but it's also a really, you know, insulting theory because you had people like a Gandhi or a Mandela who were able to, you know, push away some of those drives at the bottom. Maybe they're, they're you know, they drive for their own food or their own survival to, to have something which was bigger than themselves. So this, this idea that <clears throat> there is, can be a balance or imbalance between these drives and that they don't build upon each other is really important. And another thing that is really important is this idea that if any of the drives gets out of control, out of balance, an individual can lead a very unsustainable life. So if you think about, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, you know, in this movie, you have somebody who is, you know, a rogue trader, he gets more money, and the more money he gets, the more money he wants, it's, it's relentless, it's never ending. And, you know, this theory says that the way to, you know, put that drive in check is not to get more money, but to do something else. Right. And, and it got Steve and I to, to think about, not just at an individual level, but Let's think about how these drives exist in society, right? And, you know, we looked and we, we thought that, you know, there are different times in history when maybe at a societal level, different drives have been dominant. So, you know, you see the Cold War, or you see Brexit, or you see this issue in Ukraine at the moment. Is this the, the drive to defend gone crazy? Is it, are we living in a world where we're just defending against things that don't, you know, uh, you know, that do or don't exist and or you know do we get the the population in russia to support putin by being on the defensive so you know when we look at the world today and when we look at the the dominant drives that are out there i think there are two out there on a political level there's this this notion you know with of this drive to defend becoming more important where we've had trumpism and brexit and this rise of the cold war and then clearly we also have this drive to acquire money and status which is a is a huge thing um, and it plays out for, for organizations as well. You know, it's, it's often for an organization all about that drive to acquire money, to do things, to, to gain money, to gain status. So, you know, when we work with Unilever, we thought to ourselves, you know, this is a massive missed opportunity. Here we are as a species, we're these wonderful creatures, right? The things that motivate us aren't just status and money. They're about bonding. They're about meaning. They're about purpose, they're about learning, they're about defending. But so few of those levers are used when we drive, when, when we engage with business organizations. And could we, you know, engage with those aspects more? And, you know, so we, we asked ourselves, you know, if it's our human nature that's got us into this, if it's our drive to acquire, our drive to, def you know, that, that's got us into this mess, can our humanity get us out of it? And, you know, when we applied these drives to the world of business, we thought, you know, to inform the purpose of business, you know, sure, you know, we can, a business can be the provider of quality products, but it can also be a facilitator of conversations. It can also be a co-creator of purpose. It can be an educator in the space of sustainable consumption, and it can be a defender of what's important. So, there are so many more currencies, so many more levers that we can appeal to 
that appeal to our humanity that I think can get us out of this mess. And this this work has been hugely powerful in in guiding, um, you know, Steve at Unilever and other organizations in in how they've approached the the lens of of, of sustainability. And, and you know, part of that I think is you know played out in this idea that you know that when individuals believe that their organizations have meaning and purpose, when they believe their organizations are co-creators and of, of platforms that educate about sustainability, they're more committed. So there's that positive behavior. And you know, when organizations embrace this sort of philosophy, they can also move to a position where they decouple um, the environmental impacts, the social impacts and the societal impacts. So if you look at this um, model from Unilever, here they have a goal that is about doubling the size of the business, right? And, and normally doubling the size of the business would involve um, creating more environmental impacts, uh, perhaps creating less positive social impacts. So they've embraced this notion of saying, hey, if we can learn, if we can innovate, if we can defend, if we can you know, create communities, maybe we can decouple this idea of economic growth from uh, environment, environmental impact. Maybe we can even reduce it. Maybe we can increase societal impact. And so that's, that's the challenge. That's the mountain. How do we do that? And um, luckily, I'm just the academic, uh, according to uh, Jean-Pierre, I'm just the engine that created something. And now, thankfully, we have Kanye, who's going to talk to us about how do you do this? How do you, how do you in practice, right? And, and what, what can we learn from her in her own personal journey and her own personal life? Um, and I'm so excited to have Kanye next. It was, it was an absolute, you know, it was one of those meetings when I met her, it was wow, you know? Um, and so Kanye, I'm so looking forward to hearing your presentation on how we turn this in, into reality. Kevin, thank you so much. I hope you can hear and see me clearly. If you hear any sound, there is thunder in Johannesburg, I'm pleased to say. So announcing that Africa is in the room. And thank you so much for the opportunity, particularly to all the academia at Henley Business School, where I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm going to share my slide um, just to talk about my journey of sustainability. So who is Kanye? Kanye is a long distance runner who has done over 200 uh, marathons. Don't ask me why. And it also just shows how old I am to be able to do this. And those include completing 10 to Oceans Marathon, which is 56 kilometers taking place in Cape Town. Over 10 Congress Marathon, 87 kilometers. Um, international marathons in Paris and China. My most pride and joy is having completed the world major marathons. And why do I do this? Is to create awareness about the issues that our world is facing through my running, through my climbing. I'm also a mother to many young people who have applied to get education, who have no infrastructure, who have no kind of support that many of us are accustomed to. So part of my journey as one of the custodians of the sustainability um, journey is to make sure that actively I actually do something about it, even though uh, it's very difficult. We found, I mean, Kevin, you spoke quite a lot about what sustainability means. So we found the world breathing, a healthy world that can actually function uh, without us. And if you, I think you touched the point that by being here, um, we now created a world that's hemorrhaging on its own. And it did not do anything, this world, but it's us who have actually impacted it in, the, in this manner. And the reality today is all the social ills that we are finding ourselves in and everything that is dysfunctional, which simply says we may be throwing money we may still be talking about big numbers. This is the language that many people who are severely impacted may not even understand because the level at which we may be discussing it is not reaching the level where many people would want us to start tackling. So the question for me, again, Kevin, you always, you were mentioning, is the issue of why 
and what now? Now that we know where we are, and I don't think we can continue to deny the fact that we have all played a role. That doesn't matter who you are, where you are sitting. COVID-19 exposed the fact that we all have a role to play and therefore we have choices we can make today. And I'm going to share my story of climbing because I'm also a mountaineer. Again, my climbing is at the back of how can I use some of the opportunities that I have to create a bigger voice for those who may not have a voice. But also when you climb on a mountain, mountain has a metaphor. It's all about challenges and difficulties, but it's also how we're trying to conquer the mountains to get to the top. You know, Sir, Sir Edmund um, has got a very powerful quote where he says, you do not measure the mountain where you, when you are at the bottom. So we may see the issues of sustainability. I mean, Kevin, when we're sharing the numbers, the billions, the millions, it is scary. And you were right, COP26 was good, but again, many, many pledges were made. Again, billions of, of, num of numbers, but what does it mean in the bigger scheme of things? On this mountain, Mafadi in South Africa, the highest peak, only 3,400 meters on day one. The biggest lesson was, it is a mountain that needs to be climbed. Yes, it might be a smaller mountain compared to biggest mountains around the world, but the journey of this mountain from day one, it really showed us how hard it is to tackle a journey as big as trying to summit a mountain. It was only one and a half day to get to the summit. And my surprise, I was very pleased that it only took us one and a half day to get to the top. Beautiful in the morning when we reached our summit together as a team and we celebrated. Little did we know that what was actually awaiting us was going down this mountain. It took us over 19 to 20 hours to try and descend a mountain that took us one and a half day to actually climb. So the biggest lesson, particularly in the world where there's so much inequality, where we're finding ourselves challenged with many problems that we never even thought existed. When we had summited so many of our small mountains, amassed so much wealth, created so many opportunities for ourselves and we've gotten to so many tops so quickly, COVID-19 happened. We're sitting in a space where it's actually going time to go down. And I don't know, uh, Kevin and John and everybody, if we are able to teach our leaders how to go down, how to fall. And I think the biggest lesson from Mafadi for me, I mean, we were reduced to a point where for me to get to the bottom of this mountain, I had to sit down because everything in my body was bothered. All my joints were gone, this, despite the fact that I was super fit, but this mountain humbled us. So creating a leadership for a fairer world, it simply means there needs to be a lot of humility. And I'm glad, Kevin, you talk about, it's about psychology as well in terms of where we need to be going as far as our leadership is concerned. This is Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a mountain 20, 30 years ago, was surrounded by glacier, ice everywhere. When I climbed and summited Kilimanjaro, this is how it looked like just 10 years ago. I can tell you today it looks different and I can tell you for our great grandchildren, um, it's going to be a totally different mountain. And Mount Kili didn't do this to herself. We did, as Kevin was mentioning earlier. Biggest lesson from this mountain, day one, it was about we needed to adjust to the new terrain. There was limited resources. Everything that we are used to having, all the choices that we, we normally have, taking so much for granted, particularly in how we deal with people and resources around ourselves. Kilimanjaro, day one, you don't have the many choices that you have. Therefore, quickly, we needed to understand the whole concept of doing more with less. If you look at the second slide, on the second photo on this slide, it is rugged. It is a tough terrain. We literally, where we camping on this mountain, sleeping on the edge of the mountain, meaning you can't afford to be sleepwalking when you need to wake up during the night because you may literally fall off the mountain and you may never be found. The third photo talks to, these are people highly 
highly accomplished timbers, highly accomplished business people that I, I were with at the time, but we were all hit by mountain sickness at the same time. And therefore we were all equal in front of the elements. The last picture is how dark it was on that first night. If you see some little sparkle, um, it's actually not the stars. It's actually the, the, the light and the torch in the heads of the people who were far ahead of us, meaning there is so much that we needed to see. We couldn't see because of all the air pollution around us. On Mount Kilimanjaro, you could actually see as far as the eye could take you during the night. Leadership for a fairer world means we need to understand that there are those we need to take along with us who don't have much. It also teaches us that we all need to take a step back and be equal in front of how we need to resolve and create the change that everybody is talking about. In fact, um, Obama puts it very well that once we're looking for some other people to come up with a pay change, we are the ones that we are waiting for. When we were going for the summit on this mountain in Kilimanjaro in the first photo, that's me in the center in the white hat, an hour into our attempt to the summit, I was hit by severe mountain sickness and I couldn't continue. It was five degrees Celsius, which is completely extremely cold for people like us in Africa. But the people around me, my fellow climbers, literally refused to move on taking risk on their own lives and their own comfort because they believe we got there together, we're going to summit together. The next photo that you see there, literally somebody, one of my friends had their hand on, on my back, pushing me because I was severely dehydrated and exhausted and I was battling. And I managed because of the team, one person in front of me, the other person behind me, we celebrated together when we summited. What does this say about our leadership today? The lesson from Kilimanjaro, which was key for me, partnerships are key. The issue of sustainability is not about what it is that I want for myself, for my children, and those me immediately and, um, around me, for my company, for my country. It's about how we're going to pull together and understand that we're not going to leave anybody behind no matter how uncomfortable it can be for, for the rest of us. The last mountain I want to share the lessons, it's Mount Elbrus um, in Russia. And I'm just praying that nothing comes out of this region that's going to take the world backwards. I think there's been enough strife and many people have died unnecessarily. I'm hoping we're not going to go there. Biggest lesson on day one, on Mount Elbrus. It was, it's a totally different mountain. It's highly technical, severely cold. On any given day, we were faced with minus 24 degrees. Mount Elbrus is sitting in the center of hundreds of other mountains around the Caucasian region. So once we thought we have one mountain to deal and tackle, we had to go and climb many other mountains before we even could get to the foot of Mount Elbrus. We therefore needed to gear ourselves differently, use different tools that I had never used before. And therefore the biggest lesson was, how do you prepare for a different world? The future that we had always been prepared for, how we had been trained for leadership, how our education systems around the world, and I'm really happy to hear the work that Handy is doing. It simply means prepare differently because things are no longer the same. The following day at Mount Elbrus, in the morning, every single day, you acclimatize, you go to the highest point, you go down to acclimatize, you wake up the following day, you push yourselves further. So you stand in the queue, you align, you find your space in terms of how do you fit in and how do you make sure that the rest of the team is going to be able to climb on that particular day. What was intriguing for us is that every day we could see the top of this mountain, unlike other mountains. And the lesson was, you can't just look at the top, there's the summit, and then you all thinking we can rush at the same time. If you look at the photos, we are zigzagging around the mountain as we make our way up. And the biggest concept of mountaineering is about pace. How do we pace ourselves based on the weakest link in our team? So things change, colleagues, friends, and everybody. 
at any given time in our world. And we've seen how things have changed because of COVID-19, but it also means how we are able to manage change as the leaders today. In that last photo on this slide, actually that's me, that in the middle of our time, we were, we were in the middle of the snowstorm and I found myself lost on the mountain. But I needed to remember what is the instruction and what are the things that I needed to apply whilst I was on my own loss in order for me to be able to find myself out of the snowstorm. We can, I mean, Nelson Mandela was so happy that you started with the song. He also talk about, he talks about it's in our hands, but change is possible provided we all understand what it means. Then we were now preparing for the summit on Mount Elbrus. It was a different training altogether again because of the terrain. That's where it was a different way of training. The biggest issue on this particular one, you can see on the first photo, that's where we, we were roping, learning how we harness against each other, making sure that should it happen that one of us fall off the mountain, I, Kanye, or any other person, you throw yourself on the ground, you use the ice axe to arrest yourself, to make sure that the other person who is falling doesn't completely fall off the mountain. Leadership for a fairer world simply means we have to put ourselves at the foot of those who need us most. And how prepared are you, are we as leaders to simply say, yes, I'm used to my own comfort, but if I let the other person continue going down this mountain, by the way, they're going to take me down with as well. And we've seen with the economy, with all the investments that we have done, with all the plans that we have, that because we did not take care of everybody else, those who thought they have, even today, we are all impacted negatively. This was the last bit of our training because now it was towards the summit itself. Two o'clock in the morning, minus 24 degrees, we started our climb. The normal drill, everybody in line. This is where I found myself in the, the person in blue, that's me leading a team where we were now on the knife edge of the mountain. That you cannot actually take, make a foot wrong. You cannot take a wrong movement because you are literally on the edge. You have no other choice but to continue going up. And a lot of people were dependent on me continuing to lead this particular group. And therefore, it says to all of us, as the custodians of the economy and the well being of many people, what is my role now that I'm leading? The sense of responsibility that we have as leaders, that there's a point where we don't have a choice at the moment. I can't say, oh no, this is too hard. I'm now tired. This is too dangerous. You have a lot of responsibility as a leader. And to create a fairer world, it's even a much more bigger responsibility. At any given day, to run a one kilometer, two kilometers, it would take us less than 10 minutes. We had only a kilometer to get to the top of this mountain. It took us over two hours because of how difficult it was. Very thin air, extremely cold. And when I looked behind me and I thought I was struggling, there were more people who were struggling more than I was, if you look at the second photo. These were seasoned climbers. People were much more stronger than some of us. I mean, with what we know about snow coming from Africa, but the mountain showed us that we need each other. When we summited, the first thing you do, you look back and pull every other climber to make sure that by the time we celebrate your own climb, you make sure that your whole team is there. So critical lesson from mountaineering, it's about preparation. How do we prepare our leaders today in a different way to understand our different worlds? How do we adjust to the different environments that we find ourselves, pacing and make sure that we take everybody along with us? But the biggest lesson, which I think needs to be incorporated in leadership is humility. This is the time to sit down and reflect and act differently because we have been humble. The world has been humble. There was a time when nobody could move anyway, despite the fact that there were people who had far better resources and many options that they could have exercised. We were humble and partnerships are quite key. I like it when we work as partner, Europe for Africa, the US for Africa. 
I think we need to change the language in, in saying Europe with Africa, the US with Africa, because we all need each other. It's, a, it's no longer just about those who do not have, who are waiting to be saved. It's about how we literally pull together, like we've seen in some of my slides, which I'm quite sad that I had to rush through this. So there's choice. Are we part of the solution? Or are we going to continue to mess up our world? Because we can no longer pretend we know nothing. We have to watch those news because it is important to our leadership today to see the rot that is taking place. And then be able to say in my own corner, in my own space, it starts with me. It's in our hands. And I believe that we can all create the fair world that our leaders should be prepared for. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kanye. It was that was hugely inspirational, hugely practical, and I loved every second. And but um, for you, for you, Kanye, um, the the question is: You've been a leader in the space of sustainability in the business world, like in Old Mutual, for instance. How could how do you how would you suggest convincing senior leaders to take sustainability seriously? So should, should we start there and then I'll, and then I'll hand over uh, uh, to Kevin with, with, a, with a prepared question as well. In my working experience and life experience, if it doesn't matter to you, if it's not going to have any impact to you as an individual, you're not going to do anything about it. How I worked with our executives at Old Mutual and other organizations, we made sure together with my team that it mattered at the personal level for the leader. The CEO, it starts with them. I mean, if uh, some of the work Kevin you're doing with Unilever, Paul was one of those people who drove sustainability from his heart first. So it's about turning people around, turning the mindset by making the agenda meaningful to them. You still have to talk the business language, but you need to talk the business language that says, if you don't change, if you don't incorporate sustainable business principles, if you don't talk on the issues around shared value, if you don't create a space where how we're going to measure our impact and understand by not doing the right things, there's not going to be a job for you or that bonus or your children will never have the schools or the holidays that you think you can afford. I have made sure that I put a human level to every executive that I deal with. And I find people actually change, their eyes become much more bigger. When you say, if you're not going to invest in education, as an example, you can see, if you're not going to invest in infrastructure, if you're not going to take people along with us, some of you must have watched how in South Africa, all of us went through a difficult period when there were unrest, businesses were attacked. Because if leadership does not understand that if you don't create a space where everybody belongs and they find and they think they are part and parcel of where business is going, you lose out. Make it meaningful at the personal level first before you can talk the numbers. That is how I approached it. Huh. It's, it's, the, it's the case of the, the, sometimes the heart to head is the, longest, is the longest journey to navigate, right? So if you can close that gap, then, then you can get somewhere. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Great. Can you? Thank you so much, um, Kevin. Quest, uh, question for you: What one piece of advice would you give to somebody wanting to start their sustainable le leadership journey? Listen to Kanye. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no. So I think for me, the key thing here is, uh, and something I did take away from Kanye's talk is, you know, you don't look at the top of the mountain. If you're trying to climb it, make the goal smaller, try to choose a goal that's achievable and just do something, start somewhere. And if you're looking for places to start, you're looking for a precedent, you know, go to those UN sustainable development goals. There's so many examples of companies, not-for-profits, organizations similar to yourself, people similar to yourself who've done something uh, that can, you know, you can then show and, and legitimize what you're doing to a wider world by being part of that. So, so my big thing is to start somewhere do something however small you think it is do it and then from there you can move towards 
that one step closer to the top of the mountain, as opposed to the mountain just being so big, you just can't do anything, right? You're, you're frozen by the fear. So, um, and yeah, shamelessly go to those, to the UN development goals and, and um, steal the ideas. Great, great, thank you. Um, uh, we, we've, we've, we're gonna wrap up uh, very shortly, but I think before we do that, I can see Male uh, Malebo has raised a hand. Why don't we uh, hand the mic to Malebo Take take one question and then uh, and then we'll say good night and 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 wish you all well. Thank Hi, you. Hi. I'm sorry. There's a bit of a child background at the end. Uh, I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, the louder, the better. Yeah. So I've got a question. Right. Um, we spoke a lot about um, obviously the sustainability, and our focus was um, mostly with executives. I have a passion with frontline leaders. So now my question is, how do we then align sustainability and leadership with the frontline leaders? Because if we have strategies in organizations and frontline leaders are not aligned with our strategies in order for us to maybe um, reach our organizational goals, how do we communicate and bridge that gap with frontline leaders and sustainable leadership? Thanks, Maliba. And I can uh, pick up some of that. I'm sure Kanye can as well. I mean, I think, you know, the the best well one of the answers is to to you know uh, align the the re reward structures or, or, you know align the strategy of the organization to that sustainability strategy so you know in organizations like unilever they don't have a sustainability strategy and a strategy it's just one thing right and therefore the reward systems everything is embedded within this uh, another thing which i think is key is to you know to ask people to think about how they can align their own personal purpose to the purpose of the organization and then the purpose of uh, sustainability. And, you know, if you go back to what I was talking about is, you know, one of the biggest drivers of our behavior is to this, this feeling that we've got a meaning and a purpose. And so connecting it in there. But I think with all of this stuff, we need to take time to do this. We need to have the space where this can be done. Um, and it is all about aligning those aspects, because if it's not aligned, you're going to have an organization saying one thing and the people in the front line doing something different. I concur, Kevin, 100%. Um, Malevo, the issue is if it's not in the KPIs, if it's not going to count towards your performance management, it's not going to matter. And frontline is all about meeting those targets and making sure that their performance appraisal is 100%. So one of the best things that we did was to work with our HR human capital team and sell the concept there. And because it was now part and parcel of performance measure, there was a much more bigger incentive for our frontline to make sure that they drive the agenda. Number two, it is still a business that needs to be profitable and therefore core of this business strategy has to talk to the issues that Kevin um, has mentioned. But make sure that you don't talk a, a language that is so way above the cloud that your frontline cannot understand. Show work with them and incorporate sustainability principles that will show that they will contribute to the bottom line at the end of the day. There's a concept called shared value. So it's how you create profit at the back of creating positive societal impact. And there are organizations that have done that exceptionally well where frontline get a sense that they still can perform, they can still deliver at the same time, living a better world. Perfect. Thank you for that feedback. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks, Kanye, and thanks, Kevin. Again, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to 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 wrap up now and uh, and urge you all to join Henry Live, join the the Yes Futures Group. We'll make sure that Kanye uh, is is uh, is on the group by within within the next uh, what do you say, Kevin? Within the next ten minutes? No, but by the close of tomorrow. <laughs> and, um, and 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 if you join the group, you you can then uh, you know have have peer to peer engagement and you can carry on the conversation. So um, let, let's gr let's grow this community, the Yes Futures Handy community, and uh, we'll we'll definitely circle back to this and do another sustainability third Wednesday event over the next few months. 
Um, we're going to be back with you on the 16th of March. We've got a very exciting uh, theme and topic for the next one. And we'll share that over the next weeks. 